Hi, I just wanted to mention something before the show. If you've been to the website, you may see that I post my blog as a comic. Well, if you've ever wondered where it all began, how it all started, or just wanted to check it out from the beginning, or the fact that it's not necessarily the easiest way to look at it if you want to see more of them. So I set up an email subscription where you can just sign up and it will send you a comic each day from the very beginning. Go to AmericanBandito.com slash book. I couldn't think of a better name to put. Book seemed easy. It's one word. Each day, I will just send you a page from the daily blog. When you go to that page, you'll see the very first one that I did. It's free. If it's not for you, you can just unsubscribe. I mean, there's no obligation. No salesman will visit your door. Sorry, that seemed natural to go into that. So if you want to check it out, go to AmericanBandito.com slash book. Now here's the show. I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. I have another pop-up interview that I want to share. These interviews are from the concept for a booth that I did at my first art show this year. I just set up a booth and ask people to talk to me as they walk by. Actually, pop-up interview is a pretty good description of it. While my wife and I were at this event, the booth across the way was for a food cart. It was called the Ugly Apple. I was curious about food carts, so I walked over to ask if I could interview her. Well, I'm Laurel Burleson. I run the Ugly Apple Cafe. It's a food cart right now, but hopefully a uh, brick and mortar pretty soon. So right now you're mainly mobile. Yeah, it's, okay. and it's shaped like a giant apple crate with like a big metal apple on top. Okay, my wife and I just recently discovered feed kitchens. Yeah. Do you work out of there or do you use them at all? I don't actually. I have a different commercial kitchen space that okay. I rent from. So it's a shared kitchen. So it's really similar to feed, but it's a little bit smaller. Well, I never thought of that concept before. Like all the people that do food cards, it's like, yeah, you're not yeah. located somewhere. My wife said she just discovered what it is that you do. Why don't you explain what it is that you guys actually do here with the overstock produce? Sure. So I try to buy um, like local from local farmers overstock produce in seconds, like things that they're not going to sell for whatever reason. I try to buy that to use it up to add value to their product for them and to minimize food waste and because they're still perfectly good vegetables and fruit so it's like the whole concept the ugly apple can turn into something delicious just because it's ugly it doesn't mean it's garbage and the farmers in town make they like grow these amazing products right and so they have so many firsts and so a lot of times it's like well the seconds you know they if they don't have a a place to sell it or someone who's looking for seconds then it just goes in the compost heap even though it's it's maybe just the wrong shape or yeah or it has a blemish or a scratch or it split its skin a little bit or the tomatoes are too soft you know is what there's like a, a dozen at least reasons why a farmer won't bring something to market they don't want to be known for that what made you decide to do this i mean um, the whole thing of course when you listen to it yeah. it's like well it's brilliant of course but w what made you go well now this is what i'm going to do well i'm a i'm a chef by training and trade i've worked in kitchens um, um, since high school, that's all I really ever wanted to do. And um, I worked at a major convention hotel in Chicago and a country club here in town, and it's just the amount of waste from that just kind of drew my attention to food waste, just more of a problem. You know, if you're feeding a 1,000 people at a buffet, you're going to end up with at least food for 50 or 60 left. It's, it's inevitable. Um, you can't feed exactly that many you know and they and there were some good systems for using some of that but then also just a lot of food went in the trash yeah. and so that just kind of got me thinking about like ways to recapture and reclaim and then moving to Madison I realized with a lot of the local farmers you know what they have to keep their stall stocked until the end of the day or people won't buy if they have one bunch of kale left they won't sell that one bunch how did you find these people that had the leftover kale? like like the co again the concept <laughs> is great but it's like well then you gotta find them yeah I well and I went you know before I started the business I would just kind of ask like hey so if I started a business and I was willing to buy these things from you would you sell them to me and you know I in that respect because you get a lot of skepticism I think like oh. a lot of farmers were thinking I was just asking for handouts and so, you know, like, hey, I'm going to wait till the end of the market and get something for free, you know, and that's, I had to kind of explain, like, that's not what I'm doing. I want to start a business and this is. So I just had to kind of make personal connections along the way. Um, a couple apple orchards reached out to me, actually. They found me on Instagram or something and said, like, hey, I have wintered over apples. Do you want to come get them, you know? And so building those connections, too. But once the markets start, well, now the, the Saturday market just started. Um, I also do the Monroe Street Market at Edgewood High School on Sundays. 
and I have um, a couple produce vendors there, and we'll even do like trades and things. You know, if they have stuff left over, I'll feed their crew, and then they can get me some of their stuff that they don't want to take back, and that sort of kind of working relationship. Um, or like, you know, like, hey, I really need a couple dollars a pound for these tomatoes or something like that. And it's like, yeah, you know, we'll just make it work for everyone, make it beneficial all the way around. Now, my wife told me later she thought what the ugly apple was doing was really interesting. And she's been actually working with her since that time. So again, something we never thought we would have even tried to do a year ago. Now, today, the person I asked to meet with me is someone whose stuff I saw on Instagram. I'm Haley Van Hayden, and I'm a textile artist. I do a lot of embroidery. One of the reasons I contacted Haley is I saw her stuff at a gallery showing, and I didn't realize it was her. I proceeded to tell her that her work reminded me of someone I follow on Instagram, which was her. The place that she picked in her neighborhood to do the interview was the Johnson Public House. I was a bit nervous when I went to record this interview because up until now, I had not interviewed anybody in a public setting. I talked to Kelly outside, and Linda got us a private room at the library. And now, here I was, pulling a microphone and a recorder out of my bag in the middle of a coffee shop. I really appreciate the work that goes into doing embroidery, but I know very little about it. That is the real reason I wanted to talk to her, to learn more about it, like cars. I'm not going to be a mechanic anytime soon, but I can at least educate myself about how they work. <laughs> so why did you switch from one to the other? Actually, because of a woman named Bethany Myers. She she does fitness. She's incredible. And I had been following her on Instagram for a while and then like reached out to her because I was going to be in New York visiting friends. And I wanted to take her class. I don't do fitness ever, but I really want to take it. So I signed up and I just like messaged her saying, I can't wait to be in your class. And she messaged me back and was like, I just checked your profile out and I love your work. Like what all this great stuff. I was like, whoa, first of all, you responded to me. Second of all, thanks for looking at my page. And then she asked if I did custom work. And so I definitely wasn't actually prepared to do any custom work at that point but I was like yes I will do whatever and I had mentioned like a couple different options for it so I could do like framed in a hoop for your home like I could do patches I've been following an embroidery artist Eridura, Erica Duran I think is her name okay. but so I had seen like felt patches and I definitely like could tell a, a way to do it because of her work basically so then she asked me to do um, a uterus and that was like what st- that's the one that was based for her. Yes. I've been selling that one, the same uterus, or like golden ovaries, which is what I call it. And then part of the proceeds will go to Planned Parenthood of Wisconsin specifically, because there's a lot of funding that's been cut and things like that. So she was really cool and was like, yes, you know, just use it. It's, it's fine. It's not just like for me. I want that to be shared. So that's how I started Patches. And then I guess a whole million other things led me to the booties. First, I'm going to say, with the golden ovaries, was that a play on golden oldies? The golden oldies? Yeah. No. <laughs> okay, well, that's what it made me think of. What is with the butts? The butts. I guess that stemmed from a lot of my other work that I had been playing with, which was the mouths with, like, bite me under it. Yeah. And I was talking to Lauren Glassby, one of my instructors, and she was, like, analyzing my work. She's an incredible person. She was a professor and now has her own... She's a studio artist. Uh, she's amazing. If you could ever talk to her, I just recommend everybody talking to her. She's just such an insightful person. But she was looking at my work and with the lips and then like the sayings of bite me and nothing is precious and like get over it and things. It was basically these over-sexualized objects like, or parts of your body, lips and then butts and things like that. And it's so you'd bring people in with that and then push them back with these sayings that were just like fuck off basically like stay away from me thing after that class had started developing like this idea of like a booty that had a tattoo saying bite me on it or like you know those kinds of things like pull somebody in with this overly sexualized part of your body and then just like pushing them back but then it developed into something really fun for me not just like the one thing and then it was kind of tied back into my fashion roots of like I can just design basically underwear and like pattern on these it's like become a substrate for me and like it's a form that I embroider all over, you know? And so the spring summer collection I'm really excited about is like a lot of snake, snakes and florals, just very typical, well, I think it's typical spring. And then I have other ideas for summer and like, so I just can like within a realm of inspiration in a very similar way of how people design fashion and draw inspiration, create mood boards, things like that. That's what I'm gonna do with these. So it's my way of just reimagining 
I don't know, a booty. I also, that's something I struggle with, like, call them butt patches, booty patches. A friend called them an ass patch. You know, there's, like, so many terminology, too. But I think booty's just kind of fun. It's just like a, it's cheeky and lighthearted. It's nice, a word pun. Are you from Madison, or where are you from? I'm from Hartford, Wisconsin. It's, like, close, close enough. But then I was here for school, so I've been in Madison most of my young adult age years. What specifically did you come to Madison for? Fashion and textile design. So I came into the program with as that. For a second I thought I would switch to business because I have always wanted to do my own business and then there was one project that really got me. Like I had to stay up all night for this weird jacket that I was altering and I didn't know anything about altering things yet. So it was a nightmare and I was like, why am I doing this? You know, I think we all in the program had that. I think people come in with this notion of it's going to be fun. Like, oh, I get to like, I see magazines and I love fashion and it's like not at all that. Like, do you, you need to know math. You need to know how to sew. You need to know how to pattern things. Like it's a lot of intensive work. So I definitely had that moment where I was like, am I doing, is this what I'm supposed to do? You know, I'm 18 years old. Do I know what the hell I'm supposed to do? Definitely not. So did you get out of that and then you were like, hell with this? Or did you actually finish it out? I finished it out finally. But my first semester I had that question. And then I, I noticed that I only needed a calculus class to apply to the business school. So I took it. But then I was like, no, I'm not going to I'm not gonna switch. I, this is where I'm supposed to be. I had like 12 credits left. And then I graduated, finally. But the big difference was I realized that I really hated the fashion industry. Like, it's not... I was going to say, so how did you get out of that and go into this? I realized it's, like, definitely not worth to kill yourself over fashion. And I just saw it. And, like, with my health issues, like, I held on a lot longer than I probably needed to there. And then all the things the professors were telling you at FIT is, like, nothing's original. You're all copying everything that's ever been done. And it's like, why? Then I'm, why am I doing it then? You know? I feel like art school is the same way. Yeah, it's like, cool, great. You're really kicking me down, like, when I'm down. And, I mean, I think it's totally valuable to know that. I think it's silly for people to think that something hasn't been done. That, like, I know that butts have been done and lips and all these things that I do. I know it's been done. And it drives me insane. Like, I'm trying to, like, how do I become original or how do I stay true to myself, who am I, things like that. And I, I took in a lot of classes that would talk about sustainability, not just at FIT, but at UW. And it, made, it just made me realize that I, there's so much wrong with the industry that I, can't, I couldn't be a part of it. At least not in the way that I was supposed to be coming from fashion school, going into the industry, working, you know, and then moving my way up to hopefully be a creative director somewhere one day. How did you make the transition from textile to embroidery then? When I came back, I had my thesis and that was the main thing I was planning. And I originally had designed a collection, like I had a collection already, but it featured a lot of embroidery on it. And I hadn't done embroidery before, but I was really into this idea of like hand embroidery on these garments that I wanted to make. And so my professor, Mary Hark, she told me to, first of all, teach myself embroidery. She's not necessarily fashion. She's a paper artist and does a lot of embellishment work and like that's what she teaches a lot of and sustainability as well and she basically the thing that got me on this track was her telling me to teach myself embroidery so I got a book and it's a really great book I don't remember the name of it but it's like I found it on Amazon it can't be too great of a book. it's great it's just like 100 embroidery stitches or you know just like it's not something great that I'm gonna like stick in my brain so I just started doing these little samplers and then they turned into a lot more like I got so bored with just stitching lines of stitches that I created imagery around that. And so a lot of those hoops that you had seen at the art show, that was what my first works were. So I went from um, stitching on like uh, cotton muslin fabric, and that's the ones that you see in the hoop, and then I switched to felt, because I had seen that done. I had like, researched a few different ways of patches, and I've seen it done on like just a cotton material, but there's always some kind of weird stitching you have to do around it to secure it, but the felt is like the perfect solution for that, but it's not washable. So people that like like to secure patches on their clothes, that's the whole thing that I think is a struggle too with people like yeah. buying my things. It's like, well, you know, first of all, I have to stitch this on my garment and then I have to like not wash it again, so. <laughs> I know you have a store set up. How do you promote yourself? For a little bit, I was doing, like, paying for promoted listings and things on Instagram. Since Facebook took over, it's, like, changed, I think, the game of everything because they know they can make money off of people. (laughs) Like me, I hate social media. It's fine. Um, 
but it's yeah, it's still, it's really stupid. I really only have a Facebook because of being able to be like an official, not official, uh, a business account. You have to have like a Facebook page, which I don't ever do anything with. Then how do you uh, get out there then? So you're you've got the store, and then I I ran into you at a showing. Are you putting yourself out there? I'm trying to now. I love and hate social interaction, so it can only take so much. The only reason I was there is because my friend works at Promega. And so it was a friends and like family show, and she was like, "Hey, there's this like art show and also the craft fair that they do every year. Are you interested?" And I was like, "Yes!" And I, that was amazing. I love Kelsey; she's great. Oh, and she's a super smart, amazing human being. So she like hooked me up with that. That's really the only art show I've been in outside of school. The biggest. I've found right now as I've embraced doing embroidery art instead of and screen printing things but more textile art rather than fashion is that I don't know that world at all I don't have you know I don't know gallery world I don't know how to get shows curate things you know like that's not the life like that I've ever learned in school because I was going to be working in the industry and so I guess I'm struggling with that. There's a few makers groups. I joined One One Thousand. I was accepted. Yay! And I love Sarah Arts. She's amazing. Yeah, she's great. she's um, definitely helped me like work through a lot of these struggles I have. The platform she's creating for artists and makers is like amazing. And I've noticed some more popping up. Like there's a new one, Communication, that's going to be popping up. So I'm hopefully going to be selling there. I need to respond to an email. I'm really bad. I have like all of a sudden like ten emails that I'd respond to, and I freaked out. So. I'll get to that. Um, but yeah, so I'm starting to get venues. Another, I'm gonna be selling at 11,000, just like in their retail space. They're switching up how they're doing their, where, how they sell like their little pop-ups. They're changing the game, which is cool. What are they doing, do you know? Or? They're switching it up so that you can do like trunk shows. You could have another maker you're doing it with and you could have an event all of a sudden like people can come. Whereas, and they're opening up their space a lot more for that, for the public, instead of just being a maker space. Do you have one of those studios in there? No, I don't. I can't afford that right now. Also, I have a little studio in my home, so luckily, yeah, I live with uh, one of my artist friends, Sage Conrad. She has Jackalope Milk. That's her brand. So she's doing her thesis right now. She's finishing up. We both started in the same year at UW together, and then she kind of, she moved to Portland for a little bit, took a break, came back. At the same time, I came back. It was like this funny little happening again and now we're roommates but she's leaving me soon which sucks she's got some amazing stuff going on she's making beautiful bags i get to see her like put them together and we've done some collaboration together too like there was some little clutch wallets that i had printed material on as the lining and then she made the leather we're planning on doing some more things together so more collaborations or more pop-ups together i think there are some people at 1000 that i want to collaborate with and that like would be cool. I'm hoping to open up all those options. How did you find out about One One Thousand? It was because of Madewell, which is funny. I was working, and Sarah Arts had come in for it was gallery night, and she needed some pants or like help with an outfit. She had this beautiful vintage top, and she was like, "I don't have pants for this," and so I was the one helping her in the fitting room, like getting her, and I got her some like wide leg crops that look great on her. All of a sudden, she was talking about what she needed it for and all this like then I, I don't know if she brought up 1 1000 or I I don't know I had met one of the makers that is part of our group um, Melissa Jenkins who's a weaver here she's awesome she's got some really great stuff she does like wall hangings a lot of jewelry a lot of her tassel jewelry is uh, really amazing and she just got I think I saw she got featured on the Etsy homepage which is really exciting there's some really cool people so I'd met some people and like with Sarah meeting her at Madewell. Basically Madewell is my connection, so there's some really good things there, even though I don't believe in the industry and like necessarily the ethics behind it. Do you have any any plans beyond where you are right now, or are you just kind of winging it? This year I'm gonna take as my experimental phase, get my stuff out there, see if people are interested, <laughs> that kind of thing. But I, I still do really want to start my, a clothing line. I think I'm like, coming back to it, but just on my terms in an ethical way as much as I can make that possible. Okay. And definitely slow fashion, like I'm not going to be producing a million things and I, I not necessarily that I need to make everything myself, but I don't want it to be like some crazy production. So I think goals and like what I think of right now, which definitely is possible to change, would be doing my own textiles. I love screen printing and embroidery and making that a focus and then having some staple, very well-made shirts kinds of things. like. It could change at any point, but before I'm ready to like embrace on getting back into fashion and apparel design, um, I want to. I've 
narrowed it down to like how I'm gonna do the booty patches and doing like a spring summer collection right now I'm developing. I love the fact that you have collections of them by the way. You were like the spring collections coming out. I was like, that's awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Embroidery takes an insane amount of time. You're doing them all by hand, right? Yeah. Everything's by hand. Those take me like between five and ten hours, sometimes more. Honestly, they t which is why I think a big thing I struggle with specifically with those is pricing. I don't know how to price them because they're already at a point where I know people don't want to pay, you know, over 50 bucks for a patch. I don't, I don't have the time. I work full time, you know, this isn't something I can just like sit in bed all day and embroider at all. Like, I could, but I, yeah, I would go in a lot of debt. I don't, I would not be able to pay rent and my rent's really cheap, so that's saying something. Hopefully, I still have to like draw some things up, but I mean, plans are to be selling some things at Communication 1-1000 and then Aramont, which is what I'm working on right now and trying to get things rolling and having product to sell there. So if the, I think I recommend everyone checking it out. Obviously it's my work, so I want people to see it, but also it's different, it's not a typical patch. Like my embroidery is not typical of that. I, I mean, it's not just like chain stitch machine doing it. Yeah, I've seen, you've shown like how the back can get all kind of yeah. unwieldy. Yeah, because I'm doing a lot of different stitches and textures and, you know, to create the mesh or whatever it is, like, I'm trying to render. Like, the snakeskin has been really fun to play with because, like, how do I do that in thread in a very sm small amount of space? And I think I've done it okay. It's, like, my first trial lately. People to actually see them in person, maybe, hopefully, people would understand why, why they are priced the way they are and things like that. But, I mean, I will be selling them, so even just to, like, have a laugh or check them out, yeah. should, those are places. Hopefully soon, like, end of May, I think, ish, I'll have some work out. How do you protect the back of it? I just realized that as I was talking to you, I'm like, with all that stuff, it, it's like opening up a computer board and all of a sudden a bunch of wires are hanging out. Yeah, I actually use iron-on. So that, that part that's, like, so crazy with all the stitching, um, I put iron-on adhesive on and then put it, like, all of mine have another piece of felt around. So there's it's generally black that I use as the base. And so it's going to be um, kind of sandwiched in between there. So you'll never actually see that, which is why I, like... It's kind of fun little secret that I know about. But then in the back, we'll have like a line of stitching. I always iron on and then secure it again with a line just so that it, I know it's not going anywhere. And then once you started saying it, I'm like, oh, well, duh. That's exactly what you would do. <laughs> not everybody does that. I feel like that would drive me nuts if I did that. I'd be like, I'm just afraid somebody would pull it. And, well, and then they'd pull on something and then it would be like that cartoon where the sweater just undoes itself. One thing Haley talked about was collaborations and hoping to meet other people that do the things in this embroidery field. I admired that she was branching out. I was thinking I might try to do some collaborating with other animators or cartoonists sometime soon. Next week, I talked to an illustrator named Eli. To learn more about the show, visit AmericanBandito.com. And if you haven't already, subscribe to the show at AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe. Until next time, so long.